Hello and welcome to London Property, home of Super Prime. I'm your host Farnaz Fazaipour and today we're very excited to be speaking to the two heads of Garden House School in Chelsea, Mr. Jameson and Mrs. Studd. Welcome to the show. Good morning, I'll see you. Nice to see you. So let's start uh, from the beginning. We're going to try and address some of the questions that come up for a lot of parents when they're facing the anxieties of navigating their way to the London Day School. So let's start by talking to new parents of a newborn. Well, it's, it's, it's not uncommon, really, for us to actually have a, a call from someone who's literally just given birth um, to ask about registration. So it is something that, that our registrar has some um, sort of weekly experience of. But, it, I mean, it's, it's a very, very young time. It is. It, it is a, there's a lot of choice out there as well. So I understand, as a parent myself, why you might start thinking it at such a young age, you know, newborn baby. But the most important thing is to make the right choice for you as a parent and as a family. Um, and we would, the first thing we would always say is visit the school, get a feel for all the schools that you might be interested in. I think an in-person visit is essential, really. It's, it's a non-negotiable for, for us. It's very important that the parent has, has seen the school, has spoken to the people they need to speak to, has a real sense, um, not just in terms of the logistics of, of where the school is, but, but of, you know, they've got that sense of the spirit of the school. Um, they understand its ethos. They, they are sort of buying into its values. Um, so visit, there, is, there is no substitute, I think, for an in-person visit. Um, I think there's a lot of information out there with, with various consultants and, and advisors generally looking to support parents through this process, but, but our advice would be to contact the schools directly. You know, we all have wonderful registrars. It's very important to make that first step and, and register your interest. Yeah, make sure you're choosing something that is going to be right for you. Don't listen to the so much about what your friends may be doing because what's right for them isn't necessarily right for you. And you'll end up with a list of sort of non-negotiables that you'll be looking at as a parent and go, actually, that is the right fit for us. Um, no child looks back in their later life and goes, I love that school because of its facilities. They again remember it if they've had a happy time here and that they've really embraced what the school has had to offer in terms of learning and the staff and the other pupils here rather than the facilities. Yes, definitely. They, don't, they never see that children, do they? So it's not too early, is, is what I'm reading between the lines, actually. I don't think it's ever too early, it's really. I think early. if you've got a beer in your bonnet, if you really feel that you want to get that ball rolling, I think it's no bad idea. Get your name on some lists and come and have a look around. We, we, we do have calls from parents, or we have had calls from parents, actually, on their way to the hospital. You know, it, it's, that is too early. <laughs> Possibly, yes. Yes. We have actually had old pupils who come back when they are pregnant. Um, because they're very keen for their child to follow in their footsteps as well. And obviously we love having our old boys and girls back as well. Well, that's so. a huge testament to, to your achievements for them. Um, so would there be anything different apart from obviously come and see the school uh, and get a feel for it yourself that you would say to families that are relocating to London from abroad? Because obviously they're coming from different systems, different languages. So what would be your advice to, to those parents? I think, again, I think the crucial thing is obviously coming in person. But I think if the child is a little bit older, they will have more of an idea of what matters to the child, where, where their particular strengths are, what, what are their interests and passions. Um, and then they are painting a bigger picture. By coming here, they can start getting more of a feel for whether we are the right fit for them um, and whether their child's going to sort of embrace our very busy timetable and, and be happy here. And that's really what we're looking for, as much as prospective parents might say, well, what type of children are you looking for? And as, as fashionable as it is for heads to say, you know, there is no such thing as, as the garden house child. Um, you know, we, we do look for children who are kind. We do look for children um, who are at least open minded to the prospect of um, wanting to come to school and making the most of its opportunities. And, and we try and make sure from our end that, that that's the very happiest, that's the very happiest experience uh, possible. And it is, it is fiercely competitive, isn't it? You are, you are finding yourself oversubscribed from beginning to end, would you say? Uh, yes, I think at, at 4 Plus, which is obviously our main entry point, we are um, oversubscribed, which is a lovely position to be in, but, but hard. Um, you obviously don't want to turn people away. Um, and it's very hard to tell with a sort of young child necessarily which way they're going. But as, as Dan has said, it's, it's much more about the attitude as a family, are we the right ethos? Do we have the same values as them as a family that, that we're looking for? 
we're not going to be a government school ever that, that looks to separate children from their parents um, on our assessment day. That, that's very much, again, as Sam says, getting, you know, making sure that families are, are on the same page, they know what the ethos is, they know what values they're buying into them, that they believe in those values um, that run throughout the school. Uh, and it provides us with a useful opportunity to, to have a chat with that that boy or that girl and, and find out about their interests, their strengths, their potential, their, their areas for development um, and ensure that, that parents and school are, are both on the same page. It, it's the most important thing, that, that partnership approach. Yeah, we don't believe in a, an assessment of a two or three year old. It's very much see them with their family when they come in. Um, it's very much playing a game, having a conversation. We're not testing them on their ability at that young age. Um, so it's, it's really picking a community that all fits in together yes. is what you're looking and for. And you really feel that here. You, I'm sure, know as a, as a parent yourself from here that the community feel is enormous here. The whole school really pulls together, parents, staff and the pupils all working together for the same aim. And it's wonderful to, to, to be so heavily oversubscribed at that main entrance point 4 plus, given that we are um, ostensibly a, a word of mouth school. We're not a school that will ever put its name on the back of a bus or hire billboards or, or anything, you know, that, that community sort of, you know, everything that's lived and breathed within these walls happily sort of permeates those walls into local community as well, which is wonderful to be part of. And the other thing that's really unique about Garden House is that it is a, a, a school for boys and girls, but they're taught separately. So can you just talk us through that and, and, and how you think that that works Yes, I mean, I think we are quite unique in our in our structure. Um, it's it almost an overused approach. word, isn't yeah, it? But, but it this is, is genuinely unique. Um, we very firmly believe that offering the curriculum, the classroom based curriculum as single sex means that we get the very best out of our children. Um, and then on top of that, being able to offer them the opportunity to be co-ed as well on everything else pretty much outside of that classroom really does give them the best of both worlds. Yeah, I think that, that you know, the, the typical view really of, of single sex education is that it allows you as a school to subvert those um, potentially harmful gender stereotypes. It's really more than just boys being boys or girls being girls. It's, as Emma says, it's allowing children the opportunity to be, um, to be themselves. Um, and we uh, therefore you know, believe we offer the very best of single sex education relevant to teaching and learning within that classroom environment. Um, but there are also lots of um, co-ed opportunities to collaborate throughout the rest of the school day. So the entirety of the co-curriculum programme, so before and after school clubs, uh, is open to all. To, to, to both. Uh, the children come together for lunch and the boys and the girls school in, in their relevant year groups. Things like uh, residential trips, end of year productions, we believe are so much more than the sum of their parts for having both boys and girls there. Um, and while we are just under 500 pupils in all as a school, um, a reasonably large school, the number of families we have is significantly fewer. Uh, because there are so many siblings on the books, so many um, parents who want to send their son to a great old boys school, want to send their daughter to a great old girls school and um, would quite like the school run or the same school run or would quite like um, you know, to buy into the values um, that, that we share across our parts of the school. And one thing as a parent that uh, I noticed when my children left right at the end of, 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 of the school and they were boys is that they go to a senior school that's single sex but they already have friends that are girls it is magical, they can be what's whatsapping and talking to yeah. and you know these are these are families that they've known and grown up with so i think that was a, another thing that i noticed going around the senior schools which was very unique compared to a lot of the other i think those particularly as you know on top of obviously the 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 clubs and things like that that the girls and boys do together it's those residential trips that they go on from from year three upwards that really cement the friendships. Um, we were lucky this year, our middle school one, boys and girls all went for the first time. And it was the most successful trip I think I've ever witnessed in terms of the fact the boys and the girls just loved that opportunity of, of time out of school being together and they've all come home with different friendships.
And that will take them all the way through the school and beyond, as you say. Yeah. You know, we, we, it's not just referred to as the best of both worlds just because it's a catchy slogan to have on, on the website. You know, we genuinely believe that sort of single sex classroom environment and sort of broader co-ed opportunities, whether it's a co-curricular programme or trips, as, as Emma said, it, it really is the best of both worlds for our families. Now, you have to deal with a lot of uh, um, parents' as kind of uh, the, the pressure that everybody feels uh, moving, you know, from prep school to the next schools. So girls and boys have different exit points. Um, and I'm going to ask the question broadly because obviously for boys there, there is two sets of leaving, one at eight, one at 11, and for girls it generally tends to be at 11. But um, what would be your advice? Again, I'm sure you're going to say to go and look and, and get a feel for it, but what would be your advice? Because a lot of the time parents think, oh, my child must go to that school because, you know, it's the brand. But what would be your advice to parents when they're selecting senior schools and what should they be looking for? Um, I certainly say to my parents, first of all, make sure you're putting your daughter or son at the centre of your decision making. Um, really think about, first of all, what made you choose Garden House in the first place? What was it about here that made this the right choice for you? And remember, that's probably still very valid when you're moving on to the secondary school. Um, for the girls in particular at Devon Plus, there is a lot of choice out there. Um, and it's very important to remember that all of these schools are good. Um, it's very easy to get fixed on one particular group of schools, um, but all of them offer the most incredible opportunities for our girls of today. So once you get beyond the, these are the crucial things for us as a family, go and visit the schools, definitely. Try not to pin too much probably on the head because heads are transient. It's much more about the feel of the school. Um, and you will end up with a list of the things that for you are the most important for your child. I would always say have a selection of schools, maybe two or three, um, some have a few more than that. But you want to make sure in your final decision that you'll be very happy for your daughter or son to be at any of those schools, that they are all the right fit for your child. We will hold your hand through the whole process. I've been through it myself. I've got two daughters who are at London Day Schools. It is a stressful process, not for the child, for the parents. They want to make the right decision. So. I would really say listen to us you know we do know your children we know these schools incredibly well we've got a great relationship with all of the schools and we can really advise you about the right place for your child the other thing that i would say is that garden house has, has in my opinion has always been quite ahead of its time in where education is going and it is not a hot house and it is not based on competition and it is very much um designed to get the best out of the child without making them feel, you know, affecting their self-confidence. So with that in mind, where do you think education is moving towards? You know, because it's so difficult when, you, when, you, when you're in it as a parent to keep not pushing your children to do lots of exam papers and study some more and read some more and kind of lose their childhood, which mm -hmm. is the sort of opposite of the belief that I felt you have. I think it's, it's no secret, I think most schools would say the same, that, that happy children thrive and our core mission is that of a happy, well-spent childhood and out of that there is inevitable academic success. If anything, we would argue it's a byproduct of mm. that happy and, and well-spent childhood. I think as much as schools, all schools, hopefully look, look to the future and education itself, um, one of the sort of general trends of, of, of the last sort of five to ten years has been that that we, um, we don't know what the future has in store. Um, and the, the, the idea that, that children, that the job market will be the same for children in the future, that the skills um, that employers want now will be the skills that they want in the future. So it's really looking beyond the curriculum or looking at how the curriculum can best equip children for that next stage. Um, those learning dispositions, those ways of thinking, those habits of mind, interdisciplinary skills, such as critical thinking, collaboration become as important as subjects themselves and, and it's our job to ensure that, that without losing any of the, the wonderful familial nurturing fun side of Garden House that our curriculum prepares children for that next step. Mm. I think as a school we've always believed very strongly in the pupil voice um, and getting the children to leave here feeling like they are very much valued and they really believe in themselves and they're very confident about sharing their opinions in a very charming way. 
Um, and I think that is probably one of the main things when I've spoken to heads of secondary schools that they really notice about our children is that they are prepared to have a go. They are prepared to put forward an idea and justify their ideas. And that, for me, is a huge skill to have for life. Absolutely. I think Emma said the idea of, of, of a teacher standing up in front of rows of desks and, and seeking to impart knowledge on children, thankfully all schools have moved beyond that and, and inevitably therefore there's an impact on the learning environments themselves and the organisation of, of the classroom trying to get to a point which best enables pupils to be sort of active and, and proactive in terms of their own learning. When, uh, when children at, uh, develop at different stages, obviously, we now know, having gone through all the anxiety beforehand, but, you know, when, when they don't get off the waiting list at 8 or they don't get off the waiting list at 11, when you revisit them all at 13 and they've all caught up, regardless of what's happened, it's actually really interesting. And I, when, when the core subjects, obviously the maths, English are the core subjects, and then some of the other subjects that might not necessarily be done to the same level um, at 11, as they are done at 13 mm -hmm. and I found for example with French that my children have an incredible accent because what actually they've done Maybe is if they've spent the all this time French, singing yeah. French songs and really mastering the accent yes, and then yes. catching up with the rest of it is when they're ready for it, it as well. it's when they're ready for it mm -hmm. and it makes a big difference and I think that's kind of is something that people judge too early and then they see the results actually having as you say a confident happy child who's willing to stand up and make an opinion yep. so much more important than you know he did physics chemistry biology by the age of 11. and it's all there they're absorbing everything they're um you know they are as we know like sponges and it's as you say you suddenly get this moment you go oh wow that's that's come from you learning french from the age of four and now it's coming out Crazy. i think you know that's something we're particularly proud of at garden house that that breadth and balance the curriculum. All schools will, will say they offer a broad and balanced curriculum and they will all do. You know, schools have a statutory obligation, I guess, to say they offer a broad and balanced curriculum. But, but here, you know, the, the children are sort of living and breathing it, breathing it right from the word go. Um, and, and again, that, that, as Emma said, it's about keeping as many doors open to as many pupils for as long as possible. You know, we have the specialist expert teachers here across the foundation subjects right from the word go. Um, you know, no boy or, or or girl is ever going to be able to turn away from music at the age of four or five, or, or art or drama, or, or ballet, mm. as it happens. Um, because it, it takes, I think, teachers who know and love their subjects, who are the experts in it, in order to communicate that love to, um, to the children. Um, and then when a boy or, or, or girl has, has reached the age of 11 or, or a little bit older at 13, and, and they can make a conscious, well-informed decision that actually they're more of a, a scientist and a sportsman now, um, and, and possibly look to shy away from a subject. We've done our job at that very important sort of formative stage, um, you know, in the years that matter most, we would argue, in, in making sure they've had the very best education in the full range of subjects that they should. So no matter how much you say this to parents, they will keep hothousing outside of school and they will get them to do three competitive sports and, you know, they've got to read the whole Harry Potter collection by the age of nine. But in your expert opinion, you know, what is too much and what is too little? Because we are facing competition in the senior schools and they do look at these things. So what, what would you advise to parents with the, the kind of outside school pushing? I mean, it is a battle. It is a battle. Um, future schools do not want children to be forced into something they have no interest in. So a child that is taken to play tennis and actually dislikes the sport or is dragged around a museum reluctantly is not going to be in a better position. In fact, they'll probably be at a disadvantage when they sit in an interview and they're asked questions about something that they really have no genuine interest in. It's much more about offering to children something they really want to do. I mean, our clubs after school, there are so many choices. And if you want to do sport for fun, there is that opportunity. And those that are perhaps have a forte in netball can join a squad and practice it. But for parents, we would say, let us do that. Let us offer your children what they need. And when they're at home, let them be children. Let them have their proper home time um, and have that separation.
I mean, we, we talked earlier about looking for children who actively enjoy coming, coming to school. Um, and um, equally, we want children to actively enjoy um, looking forward to going home at the end of the day. It is a busy, bustling day here. Um, and um, we, we obviously, if children have made the, the most of that day and, and we've helped them to do so, we do push children here hard, but never so hard that they're on their hands and knees at the end of the day. We want them to leave and look forward to spending time with their families. We want them to have the energy to throw into the sort of co-curriculum as they see fit. And they're, they're very young, very young people. Mm. Um, it's important that, that, you know, that we're considering the whole day here, not just um, the part we play um, in school hours. And actually what's very special as a family is that moment when the children actually share what they've been doing during the day and to be allowed the time to sit around the table or chat away in the car on their way home and say, this is what I've done. Because you lose that when they get older. You, you don't have those same opportunities and that's how the children know that they are valued, that they've got something to say. And that is, that is incredibly valuable to all our children. And I think to, to talk to us um, about your, your pupil, no two pupils are the same. Um, there's no sort of um, right age to, to start a sort of co-curricular programme. There's no hard and fast rule um, for how many clubs a, a certain pupil should have. Um, it's really a case of balance relevant to the individual. Um, so just to keep us informed about, about what's going on outside and, and beyond, beyond that, we, we, we are really interested <laughs> in children's lives outside schools and how we can work with parents, um, again, um, to make sure that that happy, well-spent childhood um, is not just something that takes place inside or indeed outside school, but, but um, all the time. So uh, just to, to recap, obviously we've heard some of the ethoses and, 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 and how you go about choosing uh, pupils to come to Garden House. So, so in, in your opinion, what are Garden House's unique selling points? Um, so what makes Garden House Garden House? Well, well hopefully we've touched on, on that of our, our central mission here, which is that of a happy, well-spent childhood that, that governs everything we, we do and the decisions we make at a strategic level, the day-to-day -day experience uh, for the children who, who, who come into school. We believe in a, a broad and balanced curriculum. All, all schools do, of course. All schools have a, a statutory obligation to, to, to sort of uh, articulate that but but here um, you know it starts right from a very early age you know, a really important part of, of the idea of that happy and well-spent childhood is that we try and keep all doors open to all pupils for as long as possible so right from the word go um, children will have um, their specialist music teachers drama teachers French teachers sport teachers computing teachers you know, and it takes we think uh, an expert teacher someone who loves their subject someone who knows their subject inside out to be best placed to communicate that love with 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 the children and to get children on board with loving that subject um, that's that's really really important to us that that breadth of the curriculum and um, the depth really in terms of, of where we can take it is something that will never ever be mm. compromised here absolutely and I think and then it's the sort of overarching part of all of it is the kindness um, we've had a kindness code for nearly 25 years it is quite a trend at the moment, but it really is very much embedded in who we are as a school. Um, it's a set of rules. Or um, not rules. Actually, not rules. We don't have school rules. We just have our kindness code, which is seven points to guide all our children and, in fact, the whole school community as to how to look after each other. And if you ask any of our girls or boys, what's the best thing about Garden House? 99% of the time they will say it is our kindness code and it is... It is true, it is who we are as a school. Our children are exceptionally kind human beings and they take that with them when they leave us, we hope. And they have some excellent role models as, as teachers and assistants, dare, dare we say. But I think yeah, that's something you'll hopefully get a, a sense of when you walk around the school. It is a school where children will hold the door open for you. It is a school where they'll ask you what you got up to at, at the weekend. They're as interested in you as adults as, as we would hope to be in, in them. Um, you know, there is a sort of lovely nurturing sort of familial feel to the school um, that's partly our small class sizes that's partly our, our very very strong adult child ratios and the relationships those pupils those the children develop with their teachers and, and with their many teachers at such a sort of formative age when they arrive at four that's something that, that stays with them all the way through I think for such a huge team of teachers and assistants um, you know conceivably by uh, you know, at the time a boy has left us aged 11 um, you know, there might be sort of 70, 80 plus 
grown-ups in the building who know who, you know, they know who he is. They know his strengths, they know what makes him tick, they know his areas for development, um, they know how they can help in that. Um, it's extra pairs of ears and eyes, mm. it's extra perspectives on a pupil, it's, it's more people who are talking to each other about your, your son or, or indeed daughter's development. It's more people who um, are talking to, to you as parents about your son. Um, and it makes some very sort of powerful perspectives as they move up with us through mm. the school. And all genuinely interested mm -hmm. in each child. It's a, it is extraordinary how that works. And the high adult to child ratio has got so many advantages. And we are very, very lucky to be in that position to make sure that all the children are being supported all the time to celebrate their successes, but also to be there on those days which aren't so good. If a little child walks through our door and looks a little bit out of sorts, they will be swooped on very quickly by numerous people across the, across the building, even the other children, just to check that they're okay and to keep an eye on them during the day to make sure that they bounce back again. Well, it's been really lovely talking to you both and, uh, you know, just to sign off and touch on the subject that the Kindness Code has been 25 years, part of the ethos of Garden House, then we look forward to you leading the way forward since everybody else is now caught up with the kindness Indeed. and the mindfulness. So thank you very much for talking to Great us. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the London Property Podcast. Head over to londonproperty.co.uk and subscribe to our newsletter to receive latest updates.